Good morning. Welcome to this exciting webinar on using FME and the map text labor to create labels. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dmitry Bach. I'm a scenario creation and testing analyst at SAFE, and I played a lot with this new transformer. You actually uh, are a self proclaimed cartographer, right, Dmitry? <laughs> well, actually, I have a diploma. <laughs> <laughs> so that's more than most of us at SAFE. And so today in our webinar, we're going to be looking at a variety of ways to place labels. So uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Dale Lutz. I'm one of the co-founders and vice presidents of development here at SAFE. And um, I've been talking with our MapText friends for probably 10 years. And finally, we found a way to bring their technology together with ours. By way of background, uh, we'll explain a bit about FME in a minute, but many of SAFE's customers over the years have been anxious to see the union or the marriage between FME and MapText, and we're pleased with the result that we're going to show today. Ah, we're joined by our friend Mark Stokes, the manager of professional services, who's in the back room somewhere, and he is ready to answer the questions. And I already see questions pouring in, so keep them coming in, and we'll keep Mark on his toes, and if he can't answer you today, we'll definitely get back to you afterwards. So, just a few words about Safe Software. We're from beautiful Surrey, British Columbia, where we're excited today. We're on our third day of almost no rain in a row, and um, that always puts a smile on everybody's face. Um, we've been around for nearly 20 years, building software that moves data from wherever it is to wherever you need it to be, and hopefully adding some value along the way. And I'm sure Dimitri agrees that by labeling, we can really add a lot of value along the way. Yeah, yeah. Now your, your map can talk to you once it is beautifully labeled. We do that by making this product we call FME, which we say powers the flow of spatial data. Or really, it, uh, as I also say sometimes, it puts data in its place. So it puts you in control of your data and lets you get the data to where you need it to be in the best way. FME sits between a whole variety of different data formats and lets you integrate all of those in a single workflow or as many or few of those as you need to, both translating data, we do more than 300 formats, but more importantly, transforming data, rearranging it, adding value. And in particular today, we're going to be doing just that, integrating data also. So you can imagine labeling scenarios where you bring data from a Salesforce um, account. We can read that with FME and put that on top of a map with streets and label customers so everything looks beautiful. That's the kind of data integration we can do. So we do this using our tool called Workbench. Now, in today's webinar, Dimitri's going to jump in and start going on it. Uh, but in, in summary, Workbench is a tool that lets you create a data flow from where your data is to where you want it to be. And the blue things in the middle are the transformations in the middle. They can get relatively complex. Do you know what this one does? Yes, uh, it, uh, this is one of the workspaces that do labeling. Uh, oh, here yes. we have a label uh, the streets uh, and traffic transit in Vancouver. Right. So you're not going to quite make that live, but we're going to actually be doing more or less this uh, kind of example. Yes. Scaling yes. it up this morning. So um, before people get too uh, nervous, you make these things once and then you run them over and over again on, on your uh, data. So anything that you do in FME can be run many times. It's really a, an environment for creating a configuration and then using that over and over again. And so there is a little bit of upfront work to make that configuration, but it's sure a lot faster than writing code to solve these problems. And in many cases, people solve problems that they couldn't have solved otherwise. If you are brand new to FME, we definitely recommend you check out these couple of links. So FME League Get Started gets you into a bunch of resources that are a lot softer introduction than what Dimitri and I have time to do today or attend the exciting weekly FME desktop overview webinar, which runs every single week, I'm told, um, and hosted by, uh, I believe, our friend Craig Vernon uh, is often in there. So if you're a fan of Craig, you can say hi to him there. And Craig, is a shout out to you. I know you're listening in right now, but you do a fine job introducing what FME is. Uh, if you find that we're going a little bit too fast, we apologize for that. Uh, this other background would be useful, and this recording of this webinar will be made available afterwards to all of you, so you could then go and watch this again after having learned a bit more about how FME works. So with that, we're going to launch our first poll to see how many of you do label maps on a regular basis. So let me launch this poll. Now, there's a few choices, uh, and uh, 
you can figure out which one is the best for you as you uh, do that. If you um, label manually or automatically, yes, there is a lot of software that does do automatic labeling. And so um, we're hoping today we can show you another way of doing that. So many of you are doing it uh, automatically. Several of you uh, just aren't. So let's wait a couple more seconds. I know uh, some of our resellers in different parts of the world have said that their customers have completely quit labeling maps because it's just too expensive to do. So we'll stop the poll there and we'll share the results. So um, a lot of you doing manual labeling. I'm uh, surprised and, uh, and hopefully today we can show you some things that can help you out. The folks with automatic labeling, maybe some of you are actually already using map text but not in FME. Um, hopefully today you see some techniques that may supplement your existing workflows. And uh, the folks that don't have the right tools for labeling, well, here's hoping that uh, we show them the right tool today. So just uh, a couple of words about this uh, plugin. So FME, again, is this environment that rearranges data and supports many different formats. In the middle of a translation, you can apply what we call a transformer or a transformation. We ship with like 500 or some very large number of these. And part of the skill of mastering FME is knowing your way around there. And we try to make that easy uh, to, to ramp up on. But in particular, we work with MapText, and more correctly, MapText worked with us. They implemented their technology as an FME transformer, a very configurable one that can be placed in the middle of workflows. In fact, you can have several of them in one workflow. It is an extra cost plugin. So uh, if you have FME already, you do have to step up to a little bit more money to pay MapText for their fine technology. Um, and, uh, and I think it's good value for those that really need it. And it is sold through the SAFE uh, network through us and our partners worldwide. So that's kind of the background to uh, what the MapTex labeler is. I think it's time to roll up the sleeves and let Dimitri start to do his stuff. Okay, let's begin with our first demo. I'm going to build a workspace that labels uh, Vancouver neighborhoods. I have my, here is our workbench, and I have my source data in map info format. So we're going to bring in map info data. And ultimately, are you going to make a design file today? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I push you, yeah, okay. So anyway, that's the thing with FME. You don't have to decide at the beginning where you're going. So and now we place map text labeler. There Transformer. it is. No. Here yeah. it is. So oh. we just started typing. There's ways of searching that as well, but if you know you're doing map text, just start typing map text and up it comes. You could also type MTL. Yes. It would come up. Okay, so uh, now, whoa, there's nothing so, you can do. Yeah, it can be confusing even for experienced users. Yes. So but this red exclamation marks tells us that we probably have to click on it. Aha. Uh -huh. So here is uh, the dialogue. Uh, where we should specify which format we're going to target. And for now, let's just go to a generic, which okay. means data inspector. We uh, will get into all the, all the details behind that by the end of the webinar. Yeah, here is another uh, transformer uh, parameter that uh, is probably needs to be explained. Yes. Uh, FME works uh, in, uh, in ground units. If you use our labelers, a buffer, well, a neighbor, neighbor uh, finders. We always specify distances in ground units, meters, feet, or whatever. But labelers like font points. Yes, uh, typographic for font points. And here we say how many ground units we have in uh, in one typographic point. Okay. So if you place say twenty here, that means one font point will mean uh, twenty meters. meters. And if you then set your font size to 10, your labels will be 200 meters high. Right. Is that good for this example? Uh, yes. So that's something that often you have to play with a little bit and tweak. So now you have to define, you have to tell MapText about the layers that we're going to work with. Which essentially will become uh, input ports. Yes. The easiest way here is to import uh, your uh, existing right. feature types um, just like that. And this will become your input port. Yes. And these are the attributes, although we can type everything. Right. So after that, we go to uh, oh, configure. Yeah. And here we enter the map text uh, universe. Yes. And uh, here we can see some differences. For example, feature type in map text universe is what we call geometry type. 
So, and we will say our neighborhoods are polygons, we will say that they are polygons. So, we have four types of polygons, lines, points, and just obstacles. It can be anything which just shouldn't be overlapped by labels. Priorities, we don't care about them for now. Now, we have to style where we specify our font sizes and what we actually is going to label. So, here I'm going to say uppercase. Uh, me. Right, and there's an expression builder that can help you do that yes, too. Yes, I can, I can do it here. And uh, if you're familiar with uh, ArcGIS expression builder, it looks pretty similar. Right, so that's all map text stuff. And so you're applying a map text function to uppercase the name, and that's what we're going to actually label. Oh, yes. well, here's your size. So that's the 10 times 200. That's how many ground units it would be. Yes, and um, let's uh, set the color here. Okay, um, now we have this interesting button which uh, defines the rules, how the label should be placed and well, let's go with this one, we think it should be okay. Okay, uh, horizontal. And, yeah, just say here that we will need to label this layer and okay, and now we have our input portion. Ah, so now, right, now we have somewhere we can connect and out's coming the uh, actual labels. And so now you're going to take a look and see what these look like, I bet. So in FME, it's a common thing to pop down a visualizer before we decide, or inspector, we call them, before we decide what we're going to output to. So here we go. We're labeling something, and up comes the visualizer. Okay, well, it looks good, but we can see that some of the neighborhoods weren't labeled. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we can check uh, the rules and see what can, can be done. Uh, maybe let's inspect why, why they weren't labeled. So what is the name here? Yes. Dunbar Southlands. Ooh, it's a big mouthful. Yeah, it's probably probably a longer name. So we can try to change the rule a little bit to allow placing those labels. So here we have uh, an option allowing making multi -line, uh, multiple lines from a single label. So let's try running this workspace now. Now you have all the labels, so everything is labeled, and uh, that ends our first demo. Very good. Okay. Oh, it's time for another poll to find out what kind of maps our friends out there are going to be trying to label. So let's take a look and see what uh, what kind of data you're working with. Dimitri's examples today are primarily, I guess you call them topographic examples. But, but, um, no, I don't it's, know what it's <laughs> none of these choices. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm curious. We, we have done some experimenting with utility data and so on uh, here, both lots of thematic. If it's other, uh, please type that into the questions area and we'll uh, record that internally ourselves here. If you've done that and you feel like uh, firing that in, that would be great. So I think we'll call that good and we'll share the results. And it's pretty much an even split across uh, just about everything. So thematic, yeah, and uh, but thematic and topographic are on the top and utility very high, Dimitri. Very so that's good, what yeah. you had a you had a hunch. And we were asking uh, or thinking that if some of you want to send in some examples for us to help you with afterwards, um, especially in the utility area, that's an area where we think uh, would be interesting to do some exploration. Okay. So um, once uh, you added all your layers, uh, it, the transformer can look like, like you can see on this slide. Lots of input ports, lots of outputs, and lots of rule configurations within the parameters. So uh, this is our label manager, which already so uh, style properties uh, and rule properties. And uh, as you can see, we have different rules for different geometry types or feature types in terminology, or map text terminology. So here is the dialog for labeling points, areas which we already saw, and lines. So, and uh, now uh, let's start with our second demo. Uh, we, we will be building the workspace which already started 
Okay, you're gonna add, add more, something. Yeah, to add more layers. So now let's add a Vancouver Rapid Transit System, SkyTrain uh, lines, and SkyTrain stations. Uh, we keep them in shape format. Oh, so you're going to integrate data from different uh, sources here. I need these two layers. Okay. There we go. Oh, yeah, I'm going to connect inspectors and just uh, to see how it looks like. Maybe let me rename that to the Vancouver neighborhood. Vancouver neighborhood, just for better uh, arranging the layers. Right, and so we don't get confused with Surrey neighborhoods. <laughs> Uh, sky train lines and here let me type right so we're just setting this up so we can inspect it uh, uh, and maybe let's run it and see what uh, how we can make this how it looks like and how we can make it better so Dimitri just hit F5 to run quickly okay wow Strathcona is getting cut in half okay so uh, for better uh, visibility that's a little bit uh, change the lines and stations we can buffer the lines with buffer transformer oh yeah okay uh, let's make it 30 meters wide 15 on each side oh you're going to color them up yes let's make them red so we can clearly see where our lines are okay and here i'm going to replace points with uh, circles oh, okay or ellipses but i bet you're going to use the same uh, You're right. And uh, for those who are new to FME 2013, here's a nice way of specifying the center of an ellipse. You can just use function calls here. Right, to get the X and Y. Yes, we don't need an extra transformer uh, coordinate extractor anymore for this right. type of situation. So how wide are you going to... Okay, pretty big. No, so 100 meters. Got it. And also let's color it so that we see it better. So let's make blue outline. Uh, right, white. so this is all just setting up so we understand our data better. Okay, now it looks better, and now we can try to label these new uh, features. Yeah, I don't like the way Strathcona is, Dimitri. <laughs> we'll try to do effects. Yeah, uh, MapTex Labeler still does not know anything about sure, these existing features. Right, new features. So now you got to add new ports on that thing. Yes, again, I will just import these two new ones. Right, bang, there they are. Now you can configure and, them. Yeah. Yes, and we will configure them. Uh, we probably should uh, make uh, our neighborhoods a little bit smaller because now right. our main point is the transit system. Okay. And here we should specify that this is a line and this is a point. And I think uh, we can set priorities now. Uh, our station is probably more important than the line name oh, because okay. that's where you get it to your uh, transit system and neighborhoods probably even less important. Okay. Uh, now we will style. So here I'm going to use proper case so that every word uh, starts with uh, uppercase and then everything else is in lowercase. Right. And again, you could do that in the expression builder, but you're just going to type it. And let's make it a little bit bigger. Okay. And let's use red color. Okay. Same as the lines themselves. Okay. Okay. Um, now rules. Uh, let's see what what we've got here. Uh, I want to see my labels under the lines always. Okay. Um, I don't want to allow stacking here. Uh, you can say that we can label uh, these lines are pretty long, so we can see. We, we, will, we may want to label them more than once, uh, and let's allow them to. Go outside, uh, well, past the edge, past the edge, but not that, not much. Okay. And probably for uh, downtown area, we may want allow, to allow okay. font reduction. So if uh, map text uh, feels that it cannot place a label at that size, we allow reducing its size a little bit. Okay. So that's the. Rule. So basically, you do that now. Do you have to tell it that you're gonna? Okay. Well, I see. You still got to got to do this for the other guy as well. Yes, for, for our stations. Okay, so we're going to set up the stations. And let's change uh, font here so that we have a couple of different ones. Also, let, let's make it bigger. 
Okay. Let's set color to blue. Let's check our rules. Um, here we allow setting, we allow font reduction, and that looks good to me. Okay, so now do you have to turn on the fact you want it to label? Yes. And the neighborhoods are considered obstacles as well? Uh, yeah, let's try to run this and see how it works. All right. It, we can oh, yeah, we got. Labels. Okay, right. You're throwing them all into the same visualizer? Yeah. All right, here we go. Oh, you forgot to connect the... Uh, right, right. I didn't give any input for the uh, for the lines and, the lines and stations. So we'd have gotten the same output as we had last time. Okay, now, now we're going to have a bit more interesting thing. Okay, so what we've got here. Still, some of the uh, stations weren't labeled. Probably, well, our town, town area is really uh, dense and probably should be a little bit more liberal than our... Uh, Neighborhoods. Yes. So let me just make that change. We will say that well, neighborhoods are not that important, and we can say that lines can intersect uh, neighborhoods. Oh, okay. And let's apply the same rule for the stations. So you're going to allow some intersections to take place. Yes. Okay. Now we have everything labeled. All the stations, all the lines, two times, all the neighborhoods. Let's insert this clue. Well, still, it's not perfect for something because oh. our label is on top of the line and the station. This is what cartographers worry about, I think. Yeah, somehow we should avoid that. Why would this happen? Well, because we buffered our points, uh, our lines, and made, well, practically buffered our stations, but Master Sager does not know about that. For that purpose, we have a special transformer which will tell Master Sager that the features that should be labeled have certain sizes. Right, to kind of push the labels away from the actual data. So we have Master Sager, okay. and for lines, let's say that um, our line width will be just a little bit bigger than our buffer size. So okay. Multiplied by two, so 35 should be okay. Just to push the labels away from the lines. Exactly. And the same for the those guys were points. Stations. Okay, so you highlight the link, type the thing, it, it inserts it in place, and now you're going to say, yep, we've got a 110. You're basically pushing it 110 units away. Yes. Okay. And now I run this again. So, yes, now it looks pretty nice. And we can continue with our presentation. Yes. Well, that's impressive, Dimitri. Okay, so now we begin our question about formats. And so um, let's ask the question. We worked hard on the wording. To which formats will you send your labels? And so um, you can answer uh, multiple times here because, again, one of the interesting things about FME is the fact that uh, you can uh, choose different output formats. And I'm seeing folks uh, chiming in. Wow, it's pretty, uh, pretty nice spread. If you're saying other, again, please uh, type in a question to let us know the format. And uh, and then uh, we can go from there. Okay, we've got almost a uh, pretty good turnout here. So yeah, if it's other, please let us know. Let's take a peek. Uh, overwhelmingly ArcGIS, and that I guess reflects the fact that uh, that is the dominant uh, platform in GIS. And uh, I know ArcGIS comes with labeling technology, but sometimes this may be a good complement or supplement to that. Map info, uh, a healthy showing for Map info. Uh, we do think a lot of value for the CAD people. Taking GIS and going to CAD is a common FME scenario, and now we can do some labeling on the way. I am surprised and pleased to see the rasters. And Dimitri, are you going to show some raster stuff? Uh, the result, yes. Yes, okay. So um, we uh, thank you so much for that. Again, if you said other, and there's a lot of other, 
um, please do let us know. And back to you, Dimitri. Okay. Uh, so, G6. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now uh, we are going to talk about uh, formats. Um, why, why do we need uh, different target systems? Well, compare this to uh, images. The image on the left sends uh, labels to our data inspector having AutoCAD as a target system. Each system understands how uh, the characters are placed very, very differently. Yes. So where it begins, where, where it is, it's bottom, where it's uh, tops apart, uh, so it's very, very different. So you, you would rather probably to see the image on the, on the right as a as, as, uh, result. So, and this is why uh, the workspaces that uh, prepare labels for uh, different formats look quite different. So this is the workspace that labels uh, streets, uh, Rapid transit parks uh, for uh, Vancouver uh, in uh, for GeoMedia, and here is the result uh, visualized in GeoMedia. And this is the workspace for MicroStation. It, it looks very different because you have to think about styling when you go to CAD systems uh, with uh, GeoMedia or ArcGIS. You don't need to do any styling within. Or if you cannot do that, uh, you will style that in your uh, target system. With target system, you have to style everything, you know, layers. Right. So in these cases, what I would call the left half of the workspace ends up being the same because you're prepping the data for labeling. The right half, after we've labeled it, now we might want to do some refinement or additional touch-ups before we go to the output format, and so that part ends up being format-specific. So now, let's continue with our example, and we'll try probably the most interesting format, uh, format text. It, it is DGN. Dimitri likes DGN. Well, I, I do like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> AutoCAD, uh, in terms of CAD formats, AutoCAD is in some ways simpler to output to, but DGN has some interesting twists. So let's watch Dimitri go. Uh, let's go our Vancouver uh, webinar. The name our, okay. for our DGN. File. So we're adding into our workspace a DGN writer. Um, I bet you need a specific seed file here. Yes, this is very important. And maybe while I'm building right. it. Right, so the, the issue is the seed file contains the uh, mapping from numbers to fonts. And so that is the, the big trick, when, as well as other things in the seed file about um, units and scales and things. So that's what Dimitri set up. And so now you've got a layer there for our labels. You're firing them all to one. Yeah. And uh, I will need to insert a few more uh, feature types. OK. So we're doing another one for the lines. Do you have MicroStation on this computer? Yes, I do. I bet, are you going to show us this in MicroStation? Yes, afterwards? I'm going to. Wow, that's exciting. We almost never show uh, uh, another product. Safe supports so many that it's uh, hard for us to pick favorites ever. But today, Dimitri's going to. So what else are you doing there? You're adding one more. Um, oh, the neighborhoods. I forgot about them. Right. Now, uh, we need some styling for uh, output to MicroStation. So yes. we, we should say which colors we're going to use, um, maybe line width or weight, how MicroStation. So what kind of uh, for, uh, thing for do you that, have? For that, we have a transformer called, called DGN Styler. We have a few stylers here. DGN Styler, DWG Styler, right. KML Styler, MapInfo Styler, PDF Styler. Uh, it is better to use index colors for uh, when we write to MicroStation. Oh, so you know. You, you ahead of time knew what the index yes, is. Yes, I knew the numbers. So you got to know your MicroStation stuff. You can pick by color, and then we'll find the closest color. But uh, if you're a fussy cartographer like Dimitri, I guess you want to be more exact. So you're just going to pretty these babies up? Yes. Uh, for lines, we will use number three, which is red. OK. And for stations, numbers one and zero. 
So, okay, fill color and then the outline color. All right. So, okay, but still, uh, we have to map our fonts. Oh, right. Yeah, because uh, manifestation works with two type fonts, but it also works with uh, two other kinds of fonts, and uh, it stores them and exposes to us as numbers. Yes. So here we have to map somehow the names that map text label label that assigns to the numbers that manifestation understands. Okay, right, because the map text labeler adds an attribute which is the font name, if I recall correctly. Okay, so. Going to put that on at the front. Okay, there. Now he's injected that between all of them, and we're going to. Okay, there was an EZ font name or EZ font name, as we'd say in Canada, and uh, we're going to map that to the font number for IGDS, which is a MicroStation thing. And uh, Dimitri happens to remember that he used Times New Roman. And while he's doing that, I'll explain that how Dimitri figured out these numbers is he made his seed file, and uh, he used MicroStation then to add some text with those fonts into the uh, design file and then he uh, viewed that using FME's data inspector and found out what font numbers it, it, that were used. Are you ready to run it? Yes, let me just disable the inspectors, we don't need them anymore. Right. And the main thing. Oh yeah. I should forgot. we run it like that? No. To show the difference? Well yeah you could, but this is where we map text has to be clued in as to what our target system is so it can adjust the font metrics to place the labels in a beautiful way. Okay, let's pick uh, my my station design as a target format and run this. All right, so now we've got to fire up our friend MicroStation. Thanks Bentley for uh, being a good partner of ours and letting us uh, test and work with their stuff. We have worked with Bentley for a long, long, long time. And, uh, oh wow, so. I don't know why it is true. No. Okay. Yeah. How do we zoom to the extents? There we go. That looks wonderful. Yes, it worked well. I'm relieved. Okay. Yes. So, so this, that this is uh, the end of our third demo. Yes. And back to our presentation. Ah, rasters. So we we've talked a lot about um, different. GIS systems, many of you indicated you're interested in rasterizing. So how? what's the trick with rasterizing? So you can just walk us through this little snippet, Dimitri. Yes, here is our labeling. Uh, after that, once we got our text out, uh, we should stroke them to make, to make them uh, polygons, because uh, our rasterizer does not understand what text is set for, for yeah, rasterizing. The, and the text stroker uses the exact font definitions to make polygons. Yes, then we have to set symbology for all, all the layers and create some attributes uh, for uh, ordering your layers so that your labels are on top of your parks or streets, not vice versa. And uh, right. then, so that's what you make it in sort of transform, where we put everything in the order that it should be rasterized. Then we rasterize it and save to any raster format that uh, is. So, pretty simple, you stroke the text. Then uh, use a sorter to make sure everybody's in the right order, an image rasterizer, and Bob's your uncle. Yes. So here is uh, one of the examples. It's a PNG file made with FME, utilized in PaintNet. Uh, right. So you can see that it works quite nicely. Oh, yeah, we can do PDF. Uh, FME can write PDF, and it was a happy coincidence that it seems like ArcGIS and PDF are separated at birth. Yeah, they use uh, similar font metrics, so probably, well, yeah, this uh, coincidence or technology will help us, um, well, allow us to use uh, ideas as target system for making new content. Right, so you tell MapText, hey, I'm going to, uh, to ArcGIS, and then without, without letting it know, you just instead route the data to PDF and everything works fine. Exactly, yes. Okay. Well, and we have an interesting experiment. Uh, only a couple of customers asked whether we can somehow extract from projects into features and next to the shape file and then yes. use a different system. And this is the experimental trial. So I targeted uh, a few women, uh, replaced each character with a bounding box. I wrote a bounding box, replaced with a center point. That's a shape file, 
then I use it, I use that as a, uh, as a check file, I link to that Google file mail. Oh. For me. Nice looking maps. Yes. And it was the design. So this is basically writing the points out of every every character and sending it to tile mill. Okay. Now uh, let's talk about how FME can uh, help map text be even more powerful. Um, let's begin with data enrichment. So we have lots of transformers that will uh, measure uh, your areas uh, in different ways, uh, your, your feet in different ways. We can calculate area, length, and sense. Uh, we can estimate shapes, uh, such things as circularity or angularity. So in this example, we can compare uh, two features, uh, rather roundish column, because the picture is a circle, and three. Map sets regular is smart enough to do that uh, by itself, but if you would like to enforce certain rules, you definitely can. And that's what also is interesting is you can then get FME involved to do other work ahead of the ahead of the actual labeling by adjusting the input attributes, concatenating or creating new attributes, and it, it actually just act, injecting spaces and new lines and so yeah, on. Yeah, for example, our uh, stations in our examples, the original data set had a backslash n and forward slash n as ways of telling. Uh, the system where it should make two line labels, but we can replace them just with a single space and then map text decide where it thinks it's better to use two line, uh, uh, make a label of two or three or more lines. So uh, here is another a simple uh, custom transformer that, depending on the size of the horizontal extents of a, say, a polygon country, uh, and the length of the label uh, can add some spaces between characters to make it look nicer. So compare this with two examples. So on the left side uh, shows uh, labeling as is, and on the right side is some spaces injected. And the same uh, can apply to uh, lines. So you can measure your vertical extents and add a few uh, new lines between the, the words. Yes, so you can also do things ahead of the but to do those prior to feeding into the into the uh, labeling tool. Yeah, so and here I'm going to show uh, an interesting example with actually gamation. You know, Dimitri, before you do, I think we have time. I want to admit this is off roading. Um, I want to take a look. Can you do stuff microstation running? I can no. help again. That's okay. We'll go back. Let's go back to the to that example, and let's not go to microstation, but turn back the inspectors. So flip that back to FME generic, and uh, let's go um, re-enable the, uh, the inspectors. Yeah, and we don't care about our design file. So let's go and run this. And I wanted to show one thing, and this is an example that I. Uh, wanted to show. If you look down at the bottom there, Dimitri, where Oak Ridge is, let's zoom in around Oak Ridge. Look at that. It looks fine. So uh, what, I, what I wanted to show last night when I was running this, oh, I know why, because you have those, um, those uh, map text um, stylers ahead of it. It pushed, pushes them away from the, the lines. Mm -hmm. But what I what was, we won't then do the whole thing, but if we go back to the workspace, if you wanted to make sure that no, no um, labels cross the boundary, if they'll just go ahead and cancel that, uh, you can, no cross the boundary of a neighborhood, just slap down an intersector. And so this, for example, uh, if we connect the intersector to, no, no, just put it loose by itself, yep. Yeah? and then just drag from the neighborhoods into the intersector. Now we have the lines of, that are the boundaries of the neighborhoods. And so then we could add a layer into the map text labeler. Uh, let's just show them how you do that. So go into map text labeler, um, add a line called boundaries, 
And uh, we do have to give it an attribute, just any attribute called A, for example, is fine. And uh, yeah, none is good. No, not probably not so good. Uh, and then that's okay. And now we're going to configure and just say that that last thing, uh, the boundary is a line type and it's an obstacle. Yes. And then you say, okay, we don't want to label it. And so that's a way that now um, I won't go ahead and do this yet. Yeah, go ahead and say, okay. But if I had labels that were crossing my neighborhood boundaries and I wanted to keep them from doing that, this, oh, I have to do one more thing. I got to connect the intersected into there. Yeah. So then I've derived the geometry that I'm using for additional constraints, but I don't even want to label. And so that would be the kind of thing. But Dimitri's got a more interesting one that he's going to now show that involves what we call amalgamation. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> here I have a single country example. I run it as is. I'm trying to label Philippines. Well, this is probably not the way how you label countries. So how? Uh, so what MapTech does when it uh, sees an aggregate? It deaggregates it into pieces and then uh, tries each, to label each one. Yes, tries to label each one, and that does not look uh, well. Each particular one is labeled nicely, but not not the whole thing. Right. So somehow you want to join that into just one thing. So now what do you do, Dimitri? Well, I deaggregate it first by myself, and then to uh, and then I send that to Amalgamator Transformer. This is a transformer that's part of FME for a couple of years now. Our friends at NRCAN, I think, helped us to make this. Yes, and now let's see what is the difference. And yes. also we'll show how Amalgamator works. So here is our original feature. Yeah. Then we built lots of triangles connecting all the parts of this feature. And then we in the transformer parameters we gave some metrics. How big this uh, triangles should be to say and if we make any holes, how big should be the hole to be preserved or deleted? So, and as a result, we get an amalgam, which looks like this. And now we label only this amalgam. And after that, we get the following result. Wow, that is fantastic. So again, the end user doesn't have to know that we did that amalgamation. We just make a new geometry, label it, and throw away the new geometry. Yes. Wow. So, um, MapTex Labeler uh, tries uh, as much as it can to label everything, but uh, sometimes your map can be so dense that it is impossible. Uh, FME allows analyzing that. We can use feature merger to merge whatever was labeled with the original features and whatever didn't get a label can label that second time. Yeah, this was a surprise to me. I never really realized that uh, the labeler has the license to say, look, I just can't fit a label in. It has to have that license or that ability because you might be asking you to do impossible things, great big labels and small things. So some number of the inputs may not get a label at all. And using this technique, we can find out who didn't get labeled. And then what do you do? Well, and then I label it second time. So how? Uh, so this is our first. So you can labeler. get a second chance. Yes. So we can change our rules. We can ah. use uh, smaller, smaller font sizes, or or we can try a different attribute. For example, for countries, we can label them with names. If oh, okay. Enough, and then with numbers, if they're not. Or, or abbreviations or other things. Yes. So two of them, so this kind of shows the value of having more than one labeler in a single workflow. In this case, using the second one as a safety net to catch the guys who didn't get labeled in, in the first yes. go around. And in this situation, whatever, the, the countries that were labeled and the uh, labels uh, should ah. serve as obstacles. Right, so that you don't accident the second round. So I see, you're taking the labels that were made in the first one, routing a copy up top to the bounding box replacer. Now you just have boxes that you're only going to use as constraint features yes, or obstacles. Exactly. Wow, that's the whole world. Yes, so let me run this. You know, if only countries were as big as Canada and Russia, there's no trouble, right, Dimitri? <laughs> uh, I'm going to open this. Who remembers the SCTV sketch about what fits into Mother Russia? Uh, if anybody knows that, uh, type it in. Who knows what will happen? But it turns out lots of stuff fits into Mother Russia, including so, some labels. This is a bigger example. 
and it uses uh, a lot of the techniques we mentioned today. So here we have our space adder, uh, where we add, to, to big countries we add spaces like Australia, Canada, or Russia, China. Uh, here we have our amalgam amalgamator, we use second round of labeling, here is our first labeler for big, average and small countries, and here they label it for tiny countries, and those that weren't counted, uh, labeled uh, during the first round. So lots and lots of different uh, things. Patient different shapes, different sizes. So uh, I would recommend playing with that to, to get a better feeling of what uh, Maptex labeler can and how can we can make it even better. So I'm going to run this. And while it is running, it will take about two minutes. We can talk about uh, another oh, yes. thing that we add to map text. It's parallel processing. So uh, here, uh, my uh, image on the right shows um, my attempt to label all the parcels uh, in Vancouver, all the parcels and their boundaries. Uh, so on a single uh, 32 bits OS uh, in a single process, it simply ran out of memory. You have over 100,000 parcels and uh, over 300,000 boundaries. So when I split it into chunks uh, using our neighborhoods, which go along the streets and we don't have problems with double labeling or uh, some uh, missing labels, uh, it took only 20 minutes. Wow. So that's, and that's on a 32-bit. Now, actually, this does also answer a question some folks have been asking. Does MapTex labor work on a 64-bit FME? And the answer is yes. Yes. It does work. But um, if you can use parallel processing to break up a labeling problem, so if you know there are areas that are disjoint, then even using it on a 32-bit OS, you'll be done in a, in a faster time. And so if, you can, if folks can check out that uh, shortcut there for more details on how this works, but we can see this as being a very useful way to label large, large maps in a short period of time if you can be clever about partitioning the data by neighborhoods or by other types of attribution. Oh, uh, are we done our world labeling? Yes, so this so is our Look example. at that, you label the whole world. Yeah, you can see here. Uh, Greece, for example, is labeled nicely, although it's uh, not an an aggregate consists of multiple, multiple features. Uh, the small, smaller countries in uh, South Europe are labeled to numbers. So our Sweden here. And yeah. And what about if we go over to uh, the uh, Philippines or the Indonesia? That part of the world might be interesting. Yes, the Indonesia is very nicely done across all those islands. Philippines curving down on top. It's uh, Vietnam. So it, it shows some of the power of this, uh, of this thing um, when you uh, are able to do some transformation in addition to labeling a fairly complex situation. So in summary, I hope you've seen how the MapText Labeler is indeed a very powerful plugin that supplements all the other capabilities in FME that can help you to quickly and beautifully label your maps. The one thing that we didn't show, and actually, Dimitri, can you just pop up a workbench again and scroll to the top just to show people that um, in the top of the log case, you can see that the source data set was being passed in. So if you had other um, maps or other, and this, well, there are too many maps of the world, I suppose, that are different. Um, but, uh, well, you could have the way the world looked at, say, in the 1800s and so on. It would produce different, uh, different, different maps. But or this example, there's other things there. That, that's just to show you that you can use those configurations over and over again. You can use FME Server with a map text labeler and schedule these things to run every night or have them label as soon as a new... Back to the presentation. And uh, I think we might have one last poll question just to uh, see uh, how many folks out there, if you have FME, you can just get a, if you have FME 2013, you just uh, can get a license from us, uh, from a website, and we'll give you details afterwards to get that, to try it out. If you don't have FME, 
you can download the whole thing, map text and FME, and uh, give that a spin. And we'll give you some links. Th these resources, all the things Dimitri did today, the slides from here, uh, the workspaces, all of this will be made available to all of the attendees. In addition, there's some great uh, other resources as well. So um, we'll close the poll. And uh, let's see. Well, 82% of you are game to give it a spin. So uh, thanks very much for that uh, vote of confidence and all that all that level of interest. So um, let's see. Is, is there one more slide there, Dimitri? Yes. These are the resources I did want to uh, want to uh, point out. If you go to safe.com/maptext, and why don't we do that, Dimitri? Do you want to just uh, see if the link is hot? Um, that's a great place, a landing spot uh, that gets you into a very high level uh, discussion. There's a little, a couple of intro videos that go and uh, show you with a uh, little different voice than Dimitri or mine what's, uh, what's going on, but you can try that out. And actually, I think at the bottom of this thing, it uh, tells you, right, how do you uh, try it out? So there's two buttons there, and that's definitely something that you can use to get started. Let's um, also look, I believe, Click the Visit FMEpedia link on this page. It's right, it's, no, it's above those buttons at the bottom. There we go. Uh, and this gets into some stuff that Dimitri wrote where he gives some detailed textual descriptions of the types of things that we showed today that you can uh, look at yourselves. So uh, I think with that, we're going to just go into a quick look at some of the questions the, from today. Uh, and one of the biggest questions is, when will SAFE ever get our microphones figured out? And uh, we will continue <laughs> to work on that. Uh, we apologize for different audio problems. Some of you reported it's a, it seems like it's a very difficult thing to have two speakers um, going at once. And so if you come back again next time, we will uh, give it uh, another go with yet a different technology. It also uh, baffles me how our dress rehearsals can work fine, but when it goes to be real, um, it doesn't uh, work. So I think maybe FME should have to work on audio. If we uh, want to get this done right, we've got to do it ourselves, it looks like. So anyway, sorry about that. Um, another question, map text on 64-bit Linux, or 64-bit or Linux. Yes, it is on 64-bit. It is not on Linux. I think that is unlikely. That would be the map text uh, folks needing to port over there. Um, we'll definitely bring that up with them as well. Um, Halo text for contours to cover up line segments. Have you ever done, I guess you could um, take the bounding box of the label and then clip the linear features to get rid of the parts that intersect. Have you experimented with that, Dimitri? Do you know what I'm getting at? Well, uh, I tried that before. Be yes, I understand. Uh, I tried that before market label or, or years ago with just re regular FME and uh, it seems to Yes, so the basic idea is uh, make your labels, route one copy of the labels straight out to the output format, take another copy of the labels, replace them with their bounding box, and use that as the clipper on the linear features. And especially if you do a rotated, we can do a rotated bounding box, I think. Yes, are we, so, yeah. are you, oriented oh, bounding yeah, box. Yeah. So that, that would do uh, well. Can you output the features that did not get labels? And so that's part of this idea that uh, you catch them afterwards and do a compare with the feature merger to determine who didn't get labels and who did. Yes, that's exactly what uh, we do here. So whatever uh, uh, comes out incomplete port uh, was labeled. Right. And so then you could just output them straight away or um, or another way. So on uh, the fonts are true type fonts. I don't think the OTF fonts work. I, I think it's or the true type. I think it is. Well, somebody asked that. Ah, somebody asked Brad in Edmonton. Great. Uh, thanks for tuning in, Brad. You asked if we can do output to Oracle Spatial with the labels. And we were told by some early customers. Actually, I mentioned at the, at the start of the broadcast that some folks had in the years past uh, built their own integration between MapTex and FME. And one of those was the National Mapping Agency of Denmark. They've been using it for years and years. And they were outputting to Oracle Spatial the labels using the map info metrics. So uh, we haven't tried that ourselves, but um, but that kind of thing can definitely work. If you are going to other things like um, DBF or SQL Server, DBF you'd be doing tricks like Dimitri did when he used the um, like going to Shape, where you basically get the label and then split it into the rotation, the font, the 
the size and all those things and put all those out as properties in a relational database so that they're all out there and maybe somebody else can uh, can grab them. Yes, somebody... we, we have text property extractor transformer that uh, uh, extracted by fields fonts, uh, the, the, the label uh, orientation or character orientation. And the rest of the, you can take from the yeah, font you will take from MapText Labeler, it will add that. And the size and the orientation can be extracted with text point property, uh, text property extract. Yes. So um, I think uh, somebody else said um, they're taking Esri data and going to GeoMedia for a dispatch system, and um, they want to do a better job of labeling the streets and they go out there. And that actually I think is a very good use case for FME. There's a lot of data in the world in, that's in geodatabases, but sometimes folks need to see it in CAD systems or other systems. And the labeling metrics inside of ArcGIS are of course tuned for ArcGIS. But as we mentioned in the format section, every system has different metrics. And so uh, going using FME to go from ArcGIS out to say a CAD system or to GeoMedia tuning the labels for that target is a very good use and should produce very good results, I think. So uh, let's see, anything else that people um, say? We will be posting a presentation and so on. And the examples, of course, we showed you in the FMEpedia things is, uh, let's see. And uh, in terms of templates, the FMEpedia does have many examples. And um, let's see, that's, I think, uh, well, somebody's asking what the price is. To be honest with you, I don't know, but we'll get back to you. Um, and, uh, and with that, but it is, um, it's, it's uh, relatively, it's about the same cost as buying FME again at the base level uh, for those that, uh, that know that, but it, it is adding a very significant amount of functionality and we will definitely follow up with you on that. Uh, I'll get my salespeople. Craig just loves, to, uh, to uh, let folks know that. So we will uh, follow that up as well. I think with that, oh, Craig's got it. Wow, you're fast. So um, let's see, in Canada, A, uh, the price for a single fixed seat of the MapTex labeler is $3,000. And um, if you've got a floating license, it's uh, $7,200. So uh, there's a scaling thing there, and then it's much less for additional floating. And on server, it's um, about $7,200 for up to, one, up to five engines. So that gives you an idea. In Canada, your pricing will vary depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, but uh, that gives you a rough uh, concept of the price. So there you go. Thanks, Craig, for jumping in. Uh, it proves that he was listening to the webinar, too. So uh, that's really good. And... Um, yeah, lots of things fit into Mother Russia. Texas, I know, if I remember correctly from SCTV, fits into Mother Russia as well. So we could label that and Mother Russia at the same time. So thank you, Mr. Johnson, for weighing in on that. Another SCTV fan, which dates him. He's at least as old as me, is what I'd say that means. So I think we're out of time. And so um, I want to also thank you so much, Dimitri, for all your effort putting this in. I want to thank the dev team at SAFE for the great job they did working with our MapText friends. And I especially want to thank our MapText friends they put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into making this integration as great as it is. And we really look forward to seeing the amazing things that you, our users, do when you combine the power of FME with the power of that labeler and start to really crank labels into all those formats. Um, there's going to be no excuse. The world's going to be labeled up the yin yang, up the wazoo after this. Um, I was listening to Directions Mag this morning. They were talking about labeling in, uh, in subway maps and so on. There'll be no excuse for poorly labeled subway maps um, after today. So anyway, this is Dale from uh, beautiful, dreary Surrey, British Columbia saying so long. And this is Mitri. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar. And may all your maps be labeled.